In just over a week's time, Donald Trump could become US president for the second time. During his last stint in the White House, Trump made very few friends in Europe. Could it be different this time around? Hello and welcome to Roundtable. I'm Enda Brady. Now, the re-election of Donald Trump would undoubtedly rock America's relationship with Europe. He's threatened to pull out of NATO, said he would end the war in Ukraine and would impose hefty trade tariffs. So what would a Trump presidency look like for Europe? And here with me to discuss this further is the journalist and broadcaster Adam Bolton, Elizabeth Bra, who is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, and in Paris, we have Nabila Ramdani, a French journalist and the author of Fixing France, How to Repair a Broken Republic. Adam, I'll come to you first of all. Trump is saying that the UK has interfered in this election process, meddling, he's made a complaint. Has that kind of damaged the relationship be even before it starts? Well, it's already started, of course, because he's been president once before. And what we are seeing is what we know about Donald Trump is that he's entirely transactional. He doesn't really care about his relationship with the UK, except for what he can get out of it. Uh, he has already had the big pay of a state visit and meeting Queen Elizabeth, who he says uh, said he was her favorite president. I rather doubt that. Uh, but anyway, um, and on this occasion, he has seen an advantage in exploiting what is really a very small story uh, for, uh, you know, circumstantial gain, basically, preparing the ground, saying we've got foreign interference in the election uh, by uh, Labour people and their communists and their far left and all the rest of it. So it, it fits in with his rhetoric. And remember that for Trump, attack is always the way he responds to attacks on him. Now, there's a lot of questions about foreign interference in the Trump campaign, the Russians uh, heading the list of people who appear to have been consistently on, on, on his side in the three elections he's fought. And also now similar complaint being made about the interventions of Elon Musk. So attack is the best form of defense for Trump. He doesn't care if in the process it tramples on the Labour Party or indeed uh, the rather feeble attempts of the uh, British diplomats to uh, try and get an inside track. Elizabeth, Keir Starmer's people went to great lengths in the summer to secure time with Trump. The meeting and the dinner went on. It overran, we were told. Have they undone some of that uh, with, with everything we've read in the last few days? Not just this summer. Uh, the Labour Party, the Labour leadership has been trying to cultivate uh, links, relationships with, with leading Republicans now for, for several years, knowing that it may be the case that they... Uh, in government would uh, would uh, intersect with with the Republican administration and indeed Republican majority in Congress. So they've been working very hard on that for years, and um, it was I think very unfortunate that this this uh, effort to for Labour grassroots activists to help the Harris campaign has come between. And it's even more unfortunate because 100 Labour activists are not going to make a huge difference in the US election. So they're not going to help be able to help uh, Kamala Harris win. But now their presence or the fact that, that they went has caused this damage totally unnecessarily. And Adam, he didn't seem to mind when Nigel Farage said he was going to go and campaign for him. That wasn't of course, he doesn't, or Liz Truss doing a book tour saying elect uh, Donald Trump. As I say, th this is entirely, entirely transactional. And I have to say, I would disagree slightly with Elizabeth. I think the uh, Labour government has probably been ill advised in attempting to uh, suck up to the Trump campaign. Clearly, there are people, including uh, the uh, British ambassador in Washington, saying Trump's going to win, so you better get on side. But, you know, they won't get anything back. Um, and uh, I thought it was remarkable, actually, that uh, the Prime Minister, having won the election on a left of centre manifesto, went to uh, New York, spent two hours with Trump, didn't appear to make any effort or to get any audience with Kamala Harris, who was only in Washington, a, a short flight away at the time. And, and uh, it may be, I think, that, you know, the government, if you, if you believe in the special relationship and 
having intimate relations uh, between Downing Street and the White House may be that uh, actually this government's going to lose out either way. Why is Kamala Harris going to owe them anything? She's not. And likewise, uh, Trump, we, we know how he behaves. Well, let's go to France. Nabila, what's the view in, in the French public, do you think? Who do they want to win? Are they happy to have Trump back again or would they rather a clean start with Kamala Harris? Well, I think, uh, you know, generally Europeans and uh, including the French are, tend to see uh, Donald Trump as a divisive figure, uh, someone who is uh, illiberal and, uh, and dare I say, dangerously irrational. You know, all politicians tend to lie or uh, at least don't tell the whole truth. But Trump is really a master of alternative truth. And that's a huge worry uh, for everyone um, in France. I think the biggest fear is that a Trump win will galvanize the success of Europe's populist um, parties and encourage uh, their normalization. Uh, his astonishing victory in 2016 was certainly a huge boost for far-right parties who set out to effectively disrupt uh, the old uh, order. And uh, his slogans such as, you know, putting America first or make America great again are all about uh, policies, uh, including um, well, foreign policy, defense, uh, trade, and, and indeed um, the economy, uh, policies that are hugely uh, nationalistic and indeed insular. And this means uh, illiberal, effectively, to, or to put it in more contemporary terms, uh, anti-woke. Uh, but uh, And this kind of economic nationalism is certainly something that many in France believe in, as shown by millions who vote for the far-right national rally, uh, for example. Uh, you've got far-right candidates uh, across Europe who share, actually, Trump's populist nationalism, uh, his hostility to immigrants, uh, simplistic economic messages, and indeed his disdain for uh, governing elites and, and global uh, institutions. But I think beyond this, Trump did pretty well with Europe uh, PR uh, when he was president. He had a very warm relationship with uh, Emmanuel Macron, uh, and he seemed to enjoy his visits to Paris immensely. He was also very respectful to Queen Elizabeth II uh, before her death, for example. And uh, I think that despite his links with extremism in the U.S., lots of Europeans see Trump as an um, old world bastion, uh, if you like, someone who believes in old institutions like European monarchy. Uh, and I think he's also anti-interventionist -ant and has pledged to stop war in Ukraine and indeed in the Middle East. And many think that the current um, American administration is a partner uh, in genocide in Gaza. And it may be that Trump can stop the killing. Elizabeth, on that point about the war in Ukraine, do you think there's any credibility to what Trump has said that day one of a Trump presidency, he would end the war in Ukraine? He's also on record as saying it would never have happened had he been in power. Well, it didn't happen while he was in power, but of course it's, it's hard to prove whether, whether that's because he was in power or because Putin uh, just didn't have uh, a plan to invade Ukraine at, uh, during those four years. Um, the, 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 the paradoxical advantage of a... Of a newcomer to politics is that he or she can think up unorthodox solutions. And uh, that is the advantage that Trump has, even though he won't be a newcomer if he, do, if he does win again. Uh, but he will be a, a very unorthodox president uh, still. And uh, so it may well be that he thinks up uh, unorthodox solutions that may work. But uh, thinking up an unorthodox solution here or there is, is not a strategy. And as the leader of the United States, you, you have to have some sort of comprehensive strategy for what, for how you view the world and what and how you want it to to uh, evolve and develop. And I was just rereading uh, on, on several transatlantic flights recently the memoirs of uh, the Soviet ambassador to the U.S. who served for 25 years. And there you see various presidents, Republicans and Democrats, trying to form that comprehensive worldview and strategy so that they can form a coherent foreign policy and security policy. And that's what he lacks because he shoots from the hip and thinks up uh, solutions to uh, one problem that one problem that he may be successful once or twice, but it's not a strategy. Adam, give us your take on Trump coming back then for Ukraine. What would it mean? Well, I mean, Trump is an ignoramus. I mean, that's the important thing. He doesn't have a sense of history. Uh, 
Uh, we're just hearing this week from uh, his uh, former chief of staff that it, uh, Trump was asking him who were the goodies and baddies in the First and Second World War and um, had to be pointed out to him that from our point of view, Mr. President, the people, the Americans and the Allies <laughs> are, 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 are the goodies. And as we know, he uh, uh, enjoyed uh, the company of strong men who uh, seem to consistently get the better of him. Now, as far as Ukraine is concerned, there are problems about the level of American assistance continuing whoever wins in this election. And I think in the end, if we look at what happened uh, the last four years, if Trump is elected, his policy towards Europe will be actually, as Rula was suggesting, rather more orthodox uh, and radical. I mean, he's not really looking for a fight with the Europeans, given that America is going to probably run down its support, given that there's big arguments. You know, the UK says it's going to have more support, the Poles are going to have more support, French kind of sitting on the fence, the Germans sort of with their defence pact this week are trying to work uh, more with the British. I mean, it doesn't look like he's going to be, unless he's actually going to come out and said America now supports President Putin openly, which I don't think he will. I don't think he'll be able to, to wind it down. Is there a fear, do you think, that he will look at the, the dollars spent and the aid to Ukraine and he will actively dwindle that down if he becomes president again? Yeah, I think he probably will, but I think that's the direction of travel you know, which is, which is, yeah, regardless, which is already being supported in, 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 in the Congress. And, you know, the last package got through, but it's, uh, the projections are to reduce it. I mean, just on Ruder's point about um, him being anti-interventionist, it's quite clear he is. It's quite clear he doesn't like fighting. It clearly frightens him quite a lot. In odd comments about, you know, people who get killed uh, fighting for their country are losers and suckers and, and all the rest of it. But I think any suggestion that, the arrival of a Trump presidency would actually bring about a settlement in the Middle East uh, more quickly it seems to me very puzzling indeed. It's quite clear that um, Benjamin Netanyahu, who is, you know, leading Israeli warmongering as far as it's there, would like to see a return of Trump. So I don't think that would mean that Israel would pull in its horns at all. Nabila, what impression do you get looking around Europe, you know, the other leaders? What do you think they would rather have in January? Trump back in the White House or a completely fresh start under Kamala Harris? Well, I think as, as far as uh, issues such as uh, war, defence and indeed economic policies, uh, there is the biggest fear among European leaders is that uh, many uh, in Europe, uh, and, and especially as far as Europe's foreign policy is concerned, is that Trump's will uh, downscale the war uh, in Ukraine and indeed stop the money uh, supply and indeed the weapons uh, to Ukraine. He has not uh, expressed any interest in seeing the war uh, going on indefinitely. And as with everything else that Trump dislikes, uh, he will squeeze the money supply. And I think uh, in particular, as far as the issue of the war in Europe is concerned, there's a strong feeling that U.S. support for Ukraine will be weakened and that continued U.S. Uh, support for NATO would indeed become questionable. And, and that's why uh, there is a sense that EU leaders, including uh, Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, are trying to uh, trump-proof uh, European institutions and indeed policies. And they emphasize the need for Europe to spend more uh, on defense, on weapons production, and indeed uh, military uh, capabilities. And I think as far as global politics are concerned, and, and indeed wars in other uh, parts of the world, Trump makes a point about getting Iran on its knees, and that's clearly worrying. But I doubt that he has any interest in any uh, in another uh, Iraq-style war, for example. Uh, it, I mean, it's absolutely uh, true that Trump's one-sided support of Israel is unlikely to contribute to a less uh, bellicose Middle Eastern region, but he may put some effort into ending uh, the genocide in Gaza, the occupied West Bank, and increasingly Lebanon. I mean, he certainly can't do much worse than Biden, and, and uh, whose uh, unwillingness to do anything about the absolute carnage will always be viewed as a huge blight, if not the biggest blight on his presidency. Elizabeth, what would Trump mean for NATO come January? 
that's what we worried about in, in 2016. And, and it was unhappy years, uh, four unhappy years, uh, that were only survived by NATO because the Secretary General, Jens Stoltenberg, was a, a very clever diplomat who somehow managed to, to uh, charm Trump and, and um, uh, dissuade him from doing the, the quite radical things that he had said he would do, for example, uh, dramatically reduce America's commitment to NATO, and he even floated the idea of the US leaving NATO. That's easier said than done. But I think uh, now looking at the a potential uh, second Trump presidency, uh, we'll see, we're likely to see what we saw in the first Trump presidency, which is he, he talks a good game about, uh, uh, about his anger at uh, America's European NATO allies and, and the fact that he wants to reduce America's commitment to NATO. As president, he did the opposite. He committed quite a bit of money to uh, European deterrence, a, a special initiative within NATO. Uh, and it's, it's really, from my perspective, incomprehensible. Why, why would you uh, damage NATO while also committing more money at the same time? Because by disparaging it, you are hurting it. And so you're essentially balancing out your, your increased financial commitment to NATO and military commitment to NATO by uh, angry talk about it. But that's, that's what he did. And I think we're likely to see uh, a, 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 a second iteration of that uh, if he wins again. I mean, he claims it was a success, his NATO policy, because it ended up with them paying more, as he sees it. And... Uh, uh, correspondingly, America reducing its contribution, which otherwise have been there. And I think we'll probably get some more of that rhetoric if he comes in. Although, you know, I would make the point that if Kamala Harris becomes president, she is, you know, she's from California. She's of Indian and uh, African-American heritage. I mean, she is going to have a Pacific perspective. And it's quite clear that the United States, you know, that pivot that Barack Obama called, or talked about towards the Pacific, uh, you know, is, is probably going to take place. And, and that you get in the trade-offs of America through AUKUS and other things, wanting the support of Europe in the potential confrontation with China, which clearly is very much on, on Trump's mind in the way he talks about uh, you know, basically trying to put tariffs and, uh, against uh, Chinese imports. And he's already said, hasn't he, that if countries don't pull their weight, Russia can do whatever they want to them. He's actually said that. I mean, well, he you know said, what's he coming. He has said they have to backtrack to a certain yeah. extent. I mean, he, he, he appeared to be questioning Article 5, which is, you know, an attack on one is an attack on all, but it seems to be going back, although that could clearly have implications for Moldova... Uh, and Ukraine wanting to move closer towards Western alliances. You know. Yeah. Nabila, let's talk about trade and tariffs. So Trump is on record as saying that if he becomes president again, 60% trade tariffs on goods coming from China, possibly as much as 20% on goods coming from Europe. I mean, a lot of European manufacturers will be very, very concerned about this, won't they? Yes, absolutely. I think there's a, a widespread understanding that Trump would embark on a campaign of economic nationalism based on um, tariffs, uh, protectionism, and indeed market exclusion, which would no doubt uh, hurt uh, EU uh, economies. And uh, he also says that he's quite big on China and he's... Um, uh, he's effectively prepared to, to take China on uh, e economically. So that will uh, certainly be of huge concern for, for, the, for the Chinese and, and, and their economy as well. Um, but I think there's a lot of uh, far-right uh, candidates in uh, Europe uh, who believe in uh, that view of the world, who believe in putting protections up and uh, believe in putting their countries first, uh, you know, to, echoes, uh, to echo um, uh, Trump's slogan of putting America first. Um, they also share a lot of his uh, views as far as society is concerned. You know, there is a public anger over what is perceived to be out of control migration, the pain of voters facing high prices and, and the cost to individuals, uh, you know, of fighting climate change. And Trump is hitting these themes uh, hard in battleground uh, states that will decide the White House uh, race ultimately. And his messages are also hitting uh, Europe uh, very hard indeed. 
um, ironically, U.S. voters do not take direction from foreigners. Uh, American presidential elections play out state by state and are far very different from those uh, for the European Union. But Europeans do take a huge interest in what is happening in America because it's the world's only superpower and one that has massive influence over every country in the world. Elizabeth, European economies are nowhere near as strong as they were in 2016. Is that a concern as well if he starts whacking tariffs on? It is, but it's also a concern for America because we should remember that tariffs are really a punishment of your domestic companies. They have to pay more to get the products that they are importing from, from other countries. And, and he seems to view tariffs as, as a punishment of foreign companies. Uh, it, they are not. Uh, of course, if you want to, to create this sort of protectionism where most things are made at home, then you do have to introduce tariffs that those things are made at home, but they will be more expensive. And um, uh, either because they are made at home or because the, the, uh, those importers at home pay more for the, for the foreign products. Uh, but it will hurt European companies. And we should remember that uh, in his previous term, when he imposed tariffs on uh, aluminium, uh, it did hurt a number of European companies. And uh, they went to America, to Washington, to, to plead their case. They didn't get very far. And I think that the... The challenge is that we don't really know which companies or which sectors will be hit this time because it is it's totally random. Why was it aluminium uh, last time and what will it be this time? So it's very hard for companies to prepare for this, uh, this scenario and, and to figure out whether they will be affected by it. Adam, when was your first US election that you covered? 1988. Okay. Have you ever known anyone like Donald J. Trump in politics? Well, we've seen people running as candidates uh, with those views. I mean, one thinks back to 1988 and Pat Robertson from the Christian right was, you know, moving in that direction and there, and there have been candidates. We haven't seen them being selected as the finalist, the nominee, uh, if you like. But this current, you know, in, in American politics has, uh, you know, been there for a long time. We've had references to America First, you know, America First was a movement in the 1920s and the 1930s originally taking, taking wow. that slogan. And we know that America has periods of relative isolationism and then periods of, of, of global engagement, which is one reason why I think that some of the uh, angst that is expressed in this country about maintaining the special relationship is deluded because there have been periods of a very close special relationship, but there have also been periods where both sides have done okay. And I, I, the, the problem which seems to me Europe, collectively the European Union and the UK now faces is that the American economy has performed much better since COVID than any European economy. But the Biden administration is not getting any credit for that. And the people who are exploiting that, as Rula has said, are, you know, Nigel Farage and, and, and the far-right parties who are continuing to be strong, and they were the people who will be most cheerful if Trump wins, and they are the people who are most opposed to traditional democratic values. Call it for us, Adam. Who's going to win? I, I've been listening to everybody. I, I say one thing. I don't believe the polls, and I certainly don't believe people who say that uh, Trump is surging. I mean, all the experts that that I trust and not necessarily the pollsters say that it is neck and neck, too close to call, we simply can't tell. And I think that's a sensible thing to say. However, there are people, James Carville would be one example, David Plouffe, who's, who's working in the, in the Harris campaign, who, if you like, apply a qualitative analysis to this. And the question is, Donald Trump's vote tends to I mean, the last two elections, he got 46%. He may get up to 48%. It's very difficult to see how he can get to uh, any higher than that. And so that, you know, even within the Electoral College, it's difficult for him. And right now, if the polls are more accurate this time than they say they are, it, you know, it, it is all the, all the analysis sets too close to call. But one can see a scenario where because of the abortion issue, because of the position of women, because women are more likely to vote, particularly young women and all of that, that perhaps we've been over-talking the strength of Donald Trump 
uh, going into this election. And, and I would, you know, by a whisker, I think it's more likely we're going to have President Harris. Time for one final point. I need to go back to Nabila. Nabila, just briefly, would Donald Trump 2.0 be good for Europe? Um, I, I think, um, you know, I, I don't think he'll uh, be any good for, for Europe. I think, you know, there's a lot of uh, fear that he's uh, effectively buoyed up, you know, far right parties uh, across uh, Europe and indeed uh, around the world. And uh, there's a lot of fear around that. Uh, if I can make a prediction, I think perhaps uh, Trump's biggest advantage is that he has, he's taken very seriously as a future president because he is a past president. And that's why I believe he's probably going, going to win the race uh, this time around against Kamala Harris. Um, I think, you know, and he will probably be because Kamala Harris is like Hillary Clinton the last time around, an election dud, to, to put it bluntly. Uh, Trump's win eight years ago had to do with, with the deficiency of the Democratic candidate, Hillary Clinton. And um, this time around as well, I think Kamala Harris is not a great com uh, campaigner. And there's plenty of people who uh, simply do not like her. They just don't take her seriously as a future president. And, uh, and I think that uh, will work in, in, in favor of uh, Donald Trump, ultimately. Nabila, Elizabeth and Adam, thank you all so much. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Just search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me and the Brady and all of the team here, goodbye and thank you for watching.